Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Ricardo Gamboa, the creator and a host of the Hood Wazi. We are Chicago's uh, only and the country's only uh, radical live and live stream news show disseminating block optic and radical perspectives on culture and politics. And we are super excited to be bringing you this teaching series, Liberations in Black and Tan, that was incited by an eruption of racial tensions and brown on black violence that happened last uh, week during the uh, George Floyd protests. Uh, so we put this together to bring in uh, Latinx professors from across the country uh, to kind of talk about uh, the issues that are at the root and to also try and find ways to create multiracial solidarities and uh, black and brown uh, solidarity. Latinidad emerged as a label in contradistinction to Anglo whiteness, whatever it is that it has become now. And the final point that I would like you to live with today is that to combat racism and anti-blackness, we need to reclaim Latinidad as the anti-colonial project that it decisively was grounded on black liberation. If, as Sylvia Winter has argued, all our present struggles with respect to race, class, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, the environment, are the result of colonial structures that define people as human or lesser human. That is through a colonial category of citizenship that are based on race, ethnicity, bodily ability, or what I call belonging versus unbelonging, one significant effect of the colonial classification of human versus less human is the emergence and dominance of an archive, a repertoire of images and ideas that define humanity only in, in as much as it approximates European values, cultures, and race which leads to a simultaneous differentiating of non-white populations in colonies as less human. So fast forwarding to the present day United States, these categories of belonging and non-belonging that are rooted on colonial processes determine who goes to prison, who deserves protection under the law, who gets pulled over by the police, who must show identification in public spaces, who can be left out of institutions and archives and sites, who gets to nap in public or run in public or watch birds in public without being bothered. If the human or those who belong is defined by its proximity to Europe, then the lesser human, racialized non-white, minoritized immigrant subjects, black subjects who all belong are presumed to be expendable, durable, Uncivil. In many global North colonial powers like the United States, these dynamics of belonging and unbelonging manifest through a discursive and economic replacement of the category of the enslaved person with that of the immigrant of color, which in some places, in some instances, is as in Black Latinx, is the same. I, I am the descendant of enslaved people and I'm also a Latinx immigrant in the United States. So race and non-citizenship work together. They're intertwined vulnerabilities, that, as David Hernandez reminds us, that make whole communities susceptible and at times defenseless against constitutional status. So immigrants now perform the labor that black and indigenous slaves, peoples, and Asian indentured servants were once forced to do in the colonies all throughout the Americas. And I'm not talking just about the United States. They also occupy the place of liminal humanity that sustains the various structures of national belonging and border making that maintain our nation. So colonial rule drives migration and coloniality defines human belonging to the nation and to the world. Immigrant as deployed in the 21st century is thus a new category of colonial oppression. Therefore, the oppression of Black people and immigrants must be confronted together. They are not separate. Immigrant belonging 
it's almost an impossibility. Now you may ask what exactly does all of this have to do with Latinidad and in particular with Black Latinidad. So don't get impatient. My answer here would be everything. It has everything to do with Latinidad and with Black Latinidad. You have a country, the United States of America, that became independent from England, but did not end the colonial project. It severed its relationship to England, but kept the same structures of domination. Why descendants of the British took over the governance of the land and of the people, and slavery continued to operate as the main source of labor. The U.S. very quickly replaced England as the dominant empire in the region and went on to invade territories and expand its domination. Meanwhile, a revolution was taking place in the island of Santo Domingo. Haitians were fighting for their own freedom and in the process setting the standard for what independence should look like for the rest of the Americas. And you know what the first thing they did was to end the colonial project? They abolished slavery and established universal citizenship for all people, regardless of their skin color. If you ask me what the model for American republicanism and citizenship should be, it's Haiti, not the United States. And revolutions exploded all over the Americas with Simon Bolivar leading the way in South America. Now, instead of taking the Haiti's lead, the United States proceeded to join Europe in bullying Haiti, imposing crippling embargo that to this date has submerged Haiti in international debt. The United States began also to assert its power throughout the region through policies of expansionism and through tactics of bullying that forced new republics to disavow blackness if they wanted to survive or else risk the fate of Haiti and be cut off from any kind of exchange, from any kind of political engagement and from the economy, the global economy. Now take the Dominican Republic, my native, my native land, for example. Dominicans became independent, an independent nation in 1844. A year after, in 1845, the United States sent a commission to assess whether the country was indeed fit for self-governance. The commission's result found that Dominicans were indeed equipped because the country was, quote unquote, mixed race, and I'm quoting from the document, original document here from 1845, they are not black like Haitians. There are enough white people there to govern. Now that logic, the narrative of mestizaje, can save you from dealing with the almighty US empire. Of course, that will make anyone pause, right? And Dominicans were not stupid. They drafted an ideology and a narrative about themselves that would erase and substitute colonial imposed racial categories with national identity, national label. Words like negro, pobrizo, mulatto, mestizo were replaced with the all-encompassing dominican. To mention one's race then became anti-patriotic. And that myth of colorblind citizenship and belonging was eventually fueled by cultural and political narratives of unity that whitewashed Dominican, Dominicanidad and exalted Hispanic values and intrinsic, as intrinsic to the nation. And something very similar happened in Mexico, in Venezuela, and in Central America. In all of this national project, mestizaje or this idea of a mixed identity became an effective tool to erase blackness. In the Caribbean, men like Gregorio Luperon, who was a black general and writer, and literally a little later, Jose Martin in Cuba, began to draft manifestos that called for a Latino America Unida, in contradistinction with uh, an Anglo-American superpower. 
The idea of Latin really emerged as a contradiction to the U.S. empire. The idea of a united identity, a united territory, a united ideology under this rubric Latin, Latino, Latinness, emerged in the 19th century as a weapon to protect themselves from U.S. colonial threat. In 1865, the United States finally ends slavery. A country founded on the backs of enslaved people's labor is now having to grapple with the possibility of color colorblind citizenship, with the possibility of black citizenship. As this is happening, the U.S. is back on its expansion horse and President Grant and others come up with the brilliant idea that they, what they can do to include black people in the project of citizenship, of American citizenship, is to expand the U.S. territory by annexing the Caribbean and eventually Central America and some people were even saying Mexico and South America, to ship, to ship off Black Americans off the mainline. And this, my friend, as absurd as it sounds, was a real argument and a proposition that was debated in Congress between 1867 and 1871 and gained a lot of traction even among prominent abolitionists, including Frederick Douglass not just in the United States, but all over what is now Latin America. They were all trying to make sense of what do we do with blackness? What do we do with race? Quote unquote, Latin people were defined through the US colonial gaze as inherently weaker and unfit for self-governance due to, and let me quote this from, from a memo to President Grant, a deficiency inherent to Latin American races, a deficiency inherent to Latin American races. That sounds racist to me. This narrative of difference was often used to justify intervention and expansion over the southern territories of the Americas under the veil of Pan-American cooperation. Expansionists believed the United States carried the burden and the destiny to lead the Americas out of darkness out of the darkness of barbarism. In the Caribbean, the idea of Latinidad was intrinsically shaped by a preoccupation with blackness and black citizenship in the face of US imperial expansion. While over time, Latinidad came to be signified, a product, it came to signify a predominantly mestizo and Hispanic eth ethno race in its conception. The idea of Latinidad was grounded on an understanding of a multiracial citizenship that included and centered blackness. Caribbean national projects in Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Puerto Rico attempted to produce a racially inclusive citizenship that would guarantee national belonging to all people, regardless of race. Well, from the benefit on hindsight, we know that this project of colorblind citizenship did not succeed, could not succeed, right? As they were not able to guarantee equality for people in the face of colonialism and global capitalism. My purpose here is to help us think about black citizenship through Latinidad and to hold those two concepts together. Now, we have this complicated foundational history in the 19th century through which Latin American identity forms in contradistinction to U.S. empire. In the meantime, and at the end of, 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 and in the hand of the white Latin American elite, which have always had the power of government and the power of defining the narrative of their own nations, the way to propose that difference was to elevate Hispanicity, Spanish language, and the cultures and legacies of Spain as the unifying principle of Latinidad. So think the think of the three uh, Fs: flamenco, flan, and fiestas. The black roots of Latin, the black roots of Latinidad, the ones that emerged in Haiti and the Caribbean, were slowly hidden and replaced by a white white mestizaje, white washed mestizaje. 
And so as Latin American migration began to grow towards the United States, that distinction did not disappear. We brought our understanding of both race and identity with us to the United States. We imagined that we're not white, that we're Latinx. We imagined that we're not black, that we're Latinx. The narrative of mixed race identity is ingrained in our historical and cultural understanding of ourselves as people. And it is what united us across national identities. So coming to the United States is a place that has a radically different racial formation process mm -hmm. that is decidedly divided into two major categories, black or white. It's not only confusing for some Latinx, it demands that we choose a side in which we do not see ourselves fitting and in which we might, quite frankly, not be welcome because for many of us, despite the color of our skin, we continue, as Lopez reminds us here, to be racialized as immigrants. So that even when we might benefit from light skin privilege, we're discriminated against because of our ethnic background or immigrant status. And when we're dark skin, we're persecuted by both the police and La Miga. I think the first lesson is to understand that blackness and Latinidad are not mutually exclusive, but rather that in its origins, the process of Latinidad emerged as a project of inclusivity that centered blackness. That was led by black people in Latin America, and that was grounded in black liberation. Then we also need to understand that white supremacy is the product of colonialism and that therefore every colonized country, every colonized country from Canada to Chile operates through the logic of white supremacy. That is a hard pill to swallow, but it is the reality that has brought us to this moment. We have been brought up to believe that European features are more beautiful we have been brought up to believe that philosophy, literature, history, and knowledge in general comes from Europe. We have been brought up to believe that blackness in Latin America is located only in the Caribbean and Brazil, and therefore has nothing to do with Mexico or South America. We have been brought up to believe that there is an us versus them when it comes to black lives and black struggles in the United States, for we are perceived as foreign. Well, those are lies. As long as we continue to believe those lies, we will lose. Finally, we need to reclaim blackness and indigeneity within Latinidad. We must center those experiences, learn them, claim them, speak them loudly and clearly until a time comes that when I say, when you say the word Latinx, what is summoned to people's minds is not the image of a white passing Spanish speaking person, but a black or indigenous person. I think the time has come for us to reclaim Latinidad as what it was meant to be, an anti-colonial project of unity and liberation centered on blackness. So first of all, thank you everybody in the Zoom chat and everybody in our um, watching on Facebook and Lordia especially. Um, what are the things that we can do in the, you know, as US Latinos that are also territorialized even further from, deterritorialized even further from that history to begin reclaiming in real ways, right? Like in real, real hardcore ways and in everyday interactions, some of that, um, some of that blackness and indigeneity. We have been, um taught and we have been uh, sort of naturalized to to experience and to think about colonialism as something that passed as something that ended rather than as this continuum one thing that we can all do i think as as, as latinx people is to find a moment in, in if, it, if it is not every day at least every week to learn a little bit more about the different historical processes, the different historical experiences, the different cultural experiences that are part of our of our fabric, whether it is in the United States or in the particular 
uh, nations that we tend to trace our, our ethnic identity. I think that all of this lack of um, uh, all of this lack of knowledge, right? The way in which the history of indigenous and black peoples has been purposely, and, and this is a project, has been purposely silenced by the colonial project. It has had an impact on how we see ourselves, uh, on how it, it explains why in a country like the Dominican Republic that is majority black and mulatto, people cannot name um, the, their black history. Perhaps because I'm an educator, perhaps because this is where I, I navigate, I think that that is one very powerful tool. I, I very much believe that learning uh, and learning through, uh, through an anti-colonial, ethnic studies centric way can be extremely powerful. And maybe that's why uh, this type of knowledges are always uh, subjugated. Damn, so learn you mother effers. <laughs> so I do want to ask a question that came off of the uh, people watching in on, um, on the Facebook Live. One of the questions was, um, how do you feel about the uh, terms like Hispanic, Latinx, Latino? The exact question is, we got so many terms, how do you feel about it? I have very little feelings about it. Um, <laughs> I think that in the nutshell, what I, I'll tell you what I, won't want, what I wouldn't want to see. I would not want to see energy be put into creating another term. Not because I think that these terms are great. I think all of these terms are extremely problematic and they all come out of colonial projects and they, co they all produce erasure. Mm -hmm. But I think it's more important what we do than what we call ourselves. I am really tired about the conversations around, around labels. Um, I don't think they're productive. I also think that we need to be extremely respectful and generous of how people choose to name themselves. So canceling people because they want to call themselves Hispanic, I think that's not wise. I think we want to hear them out and I think we want to share how we choose to name ourselves, but that's not going to change the fact that we are sharing, most likely, the same colonial oppression. What does a future of this type of Latinidad look like? What does it, what, when you imagine it, what do you see? I'm hopeful, uh, maybe because I'm an optimist or maybe because I think if I didn't have any hope, I might as well, you know, not do this. Uh, but I'm hopeful in the way in which Jonathan Lear uh, asks us to be hopeful. It's called, it's radical hoping. It's not just sitting around and like, it's not your abuelita hoping and rezando de la Virgen, so I have a lot of respect <laughs> for that too. And I, anyone who wants to pray for me, que, que lo traiga. Um, but hopeful in the way of the work we do will pay off. It has to. And what I think, what I think the future, the future will bring is um, more and more awareness of the uh, intersections of multiple struggles, just not the intersections within Latinidad, but also outside of Latinidad. How do we, how do we relate to other? Um, experiences of migration. How do we relate to others' experiences of 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 unbelonging? Um, and I think that the one of the beautiful things that that social media and sort of access to to connect to connectivity, if you will, that uh, has allowed is that we are seeing we are seeing this this beautiful ways in which people across the globe are connecting and saying it's fucked up here too. <laughs> and this is the way in which it's fucked up here, right? And so we're seeing that with the Black Lives Matter movement where there are this these conversations happening across across the globe, really, in places like Germany and Colombia and, and beyond. And think about the fact that the problem of anti-blackness is a global pandemic. It is not a local problem. Um, and that it cannot be it cannot be addressed as, as one problem and it needs to be addressed as part of a systemic problem of exclusion um, and that has everything to do with exploitation, with capitalism, with colonialism. Um, and so that, that's where I think that the future is. I think more and more of these intersectional struggles and dialogues and, and, and ways of speaking uh, back. And, and creating new spaces for for growth. Thank you so much, Logia, for being here with us. It's um, a true pleasure. Thank you.